Hey everyone, welcome back to Bible Class with Miss Carrie, and we are going to be doing a review of the plagues today. Um, I know I told you I would start with the tenth plague, but I'd like for this to be um, to show some understanding of all of the ten plagues which we've talked about, and read this from a storybook. Um, it's called. Um, the Bible story, and it's an older, in fact, it's quite old, it's from the early 60s, maybe even the late 50s, early 60s, um, 1960s, but it's still, uh, I love this, this set of books because they stick right with the Bible, but they add a little bit um, a little bit of an author's touch to it to kind of read in between the lines of the verses um, to kind of give you some explanation as to what's going on. Um, throughout this whole time. And this is kind of just a review of what's happened and up to the 10th plague. So, and then we'll start the 10th plague the next time, which will be Passover. Um, and we'll go into more detail about um, what it means and how it even um, is, it, it, it's, it attributes to Christianity today. And it's kind of a foretelling of Jesus coming and what he was going to have to do and how, we are covered or we are um, protected by um, by the blood of the lamb. And Jesus in the Bible is referred to as the lamb of God. And, uh, you know, his, his blood had to be shed for us. And so, but we'll talk about that the next time. So today I'm just going to read to you um, from this, from this book. And um, like I said, it does go along with what we've read in the Bible already. And I'm sorry, I'm trying to get myself adjusted on my chair. Um, so I hope you'll enjoy this today. Um, really quickly, we're going to pray and then we'll, we'll get started, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for your protection, your love, and how you pour out just your provision and, 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 and your love that's still here, Lord, how you, how you want us to come to you. Um, just like in Moses, Lord, you wanted to show the Hebrew or show the, the Egyptians and the Pharaoh that you are real and that you are truly powerful over all. And that if we would just submit to you and, and turn to you and repent, then you're willing to be there for us and, and to, and to welcome us with open arms. And we, so we thank you for your word, Lord, and how you provide for us through that and give us wisdom and understanding and knowledge. And I ask that you would open up hearts to understand the, uh, what we're going to be reading today and, um, that everyone that is listening would be blessed and, and have understanding about it. Lord, we ask that you would just, um, look over those who, um, who have prayer requests today, Lord. And you know who each of them are even before, um, they even come on to watch these videos. You know who they are. And so I ask that you would, um, just address each and every prayer request and according to your will and according to uh, your way and what you know is right and good for us all and help us to be accepting of that. We thank you for your son, Jesus. And who died for us. And Lord, we just love you and thank you and ask that you be with us today in this class. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. So I'm going to start out and oh, let's see it up just a little bit. Okay, good. All right. So it is surprising how many times some people have to be punished before they learn to do right. You would think that after Pharaoh had seen all of the water in Egypt turn to blood, after he'd had frogs jumping all over the place and swarms of lice or gnats, as we called them, and flies tormenting him to death, he would have come to see that the God of Moses and Aaron and the Hebrews, who had sent these dreadful plagues, was not a God to be trifled with or messed with. Um, but as soon as each plague ceased or stopped, he hardened his heart again. So he had to suffer more. Soon the cattle of Egypt began to die in droves and th by thousands of them. Then painful boils broke out all, on all of the people. Pharaoh even got boils. So did his magicians and all of his servants. And next there came a frightful storm with thunder, lightning, and hail such as Egypt had never seen before. It broke down every tree and flattened the entire crop of flax and barley. Then came myriads of locusts, I mean swarms or droves of locusts, which ate every green thing that remained that remained after the storm. The whole country must have looked like a desert. 
This meant ruin and starvation to every Egyptian family. It meant ruin for the government too, for there would be no money for taxes. And while everybody was wondering what dreadful thing would happen next, a great darkness fell upon the land. And the Bible says it was so dark that people couldn't see one another. For three, day, for three days, no one left their house. Everybody was frightened now, even Pharaoh himself. There was no sunshine by day, no moonlight at night, and even the stars were blacked out. The darkness was so dense it could be felt. Coming after all of these other happenings, it was just too much to bear. And at the end of the third dark day, Pharaoh again sent for Moses and Aaron, and just how he found them were not told. Perhaps two soldiers holding torches aloft made their way through the darkness to the land of Goshen, where to their surprise they found that there was light in the homes of the children of Israel. Through the pitch blackness, Moses and Aaron were led to the palace. It must have been an eerie journey, for there was no traffic on the streets, no movement anywhere, only awesome silence, broken by the barking of dogs and the cries of terrified children. Go, said the Pharaoh angrily as the two men came before him. Go serve your Lord. This time he was willing for all of the Israelites to go, men, women, and children, but not their cattle. Now remember, their cattle and their animals did not die. They were still, um, that, that plague did not affect them whatsoever, okay? With all of the, Egypt, with all the cattle of Egypt killed, he naturally had his eye on the beautiful flocks and herds of the Hebrews, which had been spared. But Moses would not agree. The Hebrews would take their cattle with them, and they would need them for sacrifices, he said. Now, this may have been cattle, sheep, goats, and that type of thing as well. It may have not just been just cattle. Um, but this made Pharaoh even more angrier than ever. Get out, he cried. See my face no more, for in that day thou shalt see that you see my face, you shall die. And Moses was beginning to get angry now, and he, and he said some things full of meaning which Pharaoh did not understand, not then at least. You have spoken well, he said coldly. I will see your face again no more. Then with the rising wrath, he told the Pharaoh that one last terrible plague that was about to fall upon him and his people. And Moses said, Thus saith God, or the Lord, my, by mid, about midnight, I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and all of the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of the Pharaoh that sitteth upon his sit, that sits upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maid servant that is milling that is milling, and at the firstborn of the beasts. That means any of the animals that were that they had in their in their um in their households or in their stables or barns, whatever in their possession, would die as well. Um, I lost my place here. Oh, and all of these, thy servants shall come down and, and come down to me and bow down themselves to me, saying, get out of the land and all the people that follow you. And after that, I will go out. And he went out from the Pharaoh in great anger. And the darkness had passed by now, and Moses strode through the streets with Aaron at his side. And the people looked at them in awe. What men had ever been able to work such miracles before? What men had been able to see Pharaoh ten times in succession and come away alive? And so here you can see... Um, let me back this up a little bit. Here you can see the people of Israel and they're doing great and it's daylight but over here the Pharaoh's people and the Egyptians they're in darkness and having to use torches like I talked about to even see to get around and to read or to do any of their work okay and now Moses is left and angry and he has told them no more this is it okay I forgot one page over right here don't lick your fingers. That's a bad habit I have, um, especially with COVID. Do not lick your fingers. Um, I have to go and wipe my mouth out. <laughs> the Bible says that the man that the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of the Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of all of the people. 
Now things began to happen fast. Knowing that only a few hours remained before the great exodus, that means the exit when they're leaving Egypt, okay? The people, the Hebrew people. Um, when the exodus, before the exodus would begin, Moses gave orders that the Hebrews should visit the Egyptians and collect the wages that they had not been paid for for years, okay? So they're going to rack up some money, okay? They haven't been paid and now they're going to get paid with the um with payments here like this. They were they were to ask for jewels of silver, jewels of gold, and the Egyptians paid up. They were too scared to do anything else. Then the word was sent from home to home throughout all of the land of Goshen to every Hebrew family. This is the night of deliverance. Tonight God will smite all the firstborn of Egypt. And Pharaoh will then let us go. Pack your things Prepare food for a long journey and get ready to leave. Tomorrow we shall be on our way to freedom. Imagine the excitement everywhere. It all seemed too good to be true. Old, whim, old men and women who had told long years for the Egyptians and had been beaten many times by the taskmasters cried out with thankful hearts, Thank God, thank God, it's over at last. God has kept his promise. And boys and girls looked up into their mother's faces and asked, Are we really going away, Mama? Where to? To the land flowing with milk and honey you told us about. And then their mother said, Yes. I'm sorry, I misread that. Um, Are we really going away, Mama? Where to? To the land flowing with milk and honey you told us about? And when their mother said, Yes, darlings, that's just where we are going, they cried out in glee, dancing and jumping around. Oh, good. We're off to the land of Canaan. So here they are getting ready to leave and they're excited. They're getting paid for what they worked for. And the Bible talks about how they left and they were, um, they had a lot of riches and, 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 um, they were very, very wealthy with, um, with jewels and gold and all kinds of things when they left Egypt. Um, so actually, we've got plenty of time now. So I'm actually going to move on with the Passover and what God is going to instruct them to do um, to prepare for Passover. And um, so I'm just going to read. I'm going to continue to read the story. And um, just you can follow along. And actually, you can look this up in your Bible. Just continue to read from Exodus. Um, it's around Exodus 11 and 12. So um, just kind of keep that in mind. And we always go back to the Bible. I, I say that and I reiterate that because it's so important. We always go back to the Bible. Okay. Okay. Um, on that last afternoon in Egypt, every Hebrew family and mother and father had a secret worry. If it was true, as Moses had said, that the angel of death was coming that night to smite, that means to destroy or to um, basically to kill, um, all of the firstborn in the land. Would he make no mistakes? Would he be sure to tell the difference between the Egyptian home and a Hebrew home? In the darkness and with so many homes to visit, may, might he not enter one of them in error? And to make sure that the Hebrews would not suffer from this last awful plague, God told them to take the blood of a lamb and sprinkle it on the doorposts of their homes. And when I see the blood, he said, I will pass over you. Okay, so here you can see that the father has taken uh, the blood of a lamb, okay, no, they didn't just kill it and leave. It wasn't being mean, but this has very important significance, okay? Because the blood of the lamb covers the sin of even the Hebrews. Now, we have to remember, um, there's none of us that are without, without sin. The Hebrews were sinful too, um, but they, they still believed and trusted in God. They didn't make it right what they were doing. But um, God made a distinction between them because they were putting their faith in God and trusting him and him alone to take care of them and, and to keep this death angel from passing over them. And so God instructed them to put the blood off on the doorposts, on the sides and on the top down here. And um, then that would indicate 
the, the death angel would pass over them. Hence where we get the word Passover. And I've also got a couple more or another picture here. It's not as great as this one, um, which shows a lamb that has been um, sacrificed. And remember, um, just like with Adam and Eve, we talked about this with Adam and Eve. Remember when God provided them clothes, he probably, he had to kill the animal in order to get the clothes, the skins, it says that God covered them with. And so the blood of the animal was the, um, was a substitute for Adam and Eve's sin. It took the punishment, okay, for the sin. It's the same thing here. The animal, here the blood, the lamb that God instructed them to take, um, had to, this was going to be the substitute for the sin. It was going to, they were going to, the animal was taking the punishment for the sin. Um, the sinner was repenting. This is an Israelite or Hebrew. And they had repented and they had put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. Very, very important. Okay. And so if you remember, like I said before, um, Jesus is called the lamb of God. And when he died on the cross, he became our substitute. And so um, this is kind of a kind of a mirror image of the Old Testament, what Jesus did, okay? And so Jesus, when he died on the cross, his blood was shed. He remember he was beaten. Um, if you haven't read that, you can read that in, in the Gospels um, of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in the first part of, of the New Testament. Um, but Jesus was, he was beaten, and then he was um, hung on the cross. And, excuse me, he, um, he, he and he was he bled really really bad. He pretty much bled to death. Okay, and and then was the the cross actually just suffocated him and where it had finished him physically. So um, this is very very important because um, you know we celebrate um, the death and resurrection at Easter um, in in the Christian side. But the um, in the Hebrew side, Passover is still um, is still observed every year, and it's about the same time, not exactly the same time, but close to the same time as where we celebrate our Savior, and they still celebrate, um, you know, the tradition of Passover because God commanded His people um, to do so. Now, the people today from the Hebrew and and Israelite descent. Those people today are called Jews, okay? And they're all over the world. We have a lot of Jews here in the United States um, and um, a lot of places where they worship called synagogues. But anyway, Passover is still celebrated, and this is where it comes from. And we have to connect it all together from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And so um, we'll see how that works, okay? Um to make sure that the Hebrews would not suffer from this last awful plague, God told them to take the blood of a lamb, sprinkle it on the doorposts of their homes. And when I see the blood, he said, I will pass over you. All who believed that God was with Moses did as he said. And they took a lamb or a baby goat and killed it and smeared the blood on the doorposts of their homes. At sunset that evening, the sprinkling of the blood was going on all through the land of Goshen where the faithful Hebrew people lived. Everywhere, men and women asked each other, is the blood sprinkled on your home? And if a home was seen to be without the blood on its doorpost, neighbors would bang on the door crying, don't forget the blood. It must have been quite a sight with each family standing outside of its home as the father holding a basin of blood in one hand and a sprig of hyssop. Hyssop is, a, is an herb and it's kind of like a bushy it kind of grows like on a bushy stem. And so they kind of use it like a paintbrush, basically. Okay. Um, and it's a bitter herb that they also use in the cooking because they didn't just let the, the, the meat go to waste. They actually cooked it and ate a huge, huge meal before they left. Okay. It was going to be important for them to get some nourishment. Um, in every case, the most interested onlooker was the eldest son, the firstborn, whose life was at stake. You can be sure that he made certain the job was well done. There must have been some who said, why do we have to sprinkle the blood on the doorposts anyway? What good can this do us? If so, they soon learned. It was dangerous not to put up God's sign of safety. 
Thousands of lambs must have died that last evening in Israel, the last evening that Israel spent in Egypt. Every one of them was a symbol of Jesus, the Lamb of God, which taketh to, who takes away the sin of the world. The blood sprinkled on the doorpost was likewise a symbol of, Je- of the blood of Jesus, which is shed for many and which cleanses us from all sin. And we, like the Hebrews in Egypt, obey God's word and do as he says. And when we accept Jesus as our Savior, at, as it were, sprinkle his blood upon the doorposts of our hearts, then he will forgive us of our sins and will pass over us in the day of judgment. This is what the Apostle Paul, who is from the New Testament, the Apostle Paul wrote a lot of the New Testament, and that's who they're referring to here. This is what the Apostle Paul meant when he said, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. What happened to the lamb whose blood was sprinkled on the doorpost? It was roasted whole and eaten by the whole family, and it was eaten in a hurry with everybody fully dressed, ready to leave at a moment's notice. So they put their shoes on, they got their bags packed, and buddy, they horked their food down, (laughs) okay? And so whether anybody slept that night, we don't know. I kind of doubt it. The Egyptians may have for an hour or two, but not the Hebrews. Fathers and mothers were too busy packing and getting things ready for the long journey ahead of them. As for the children, they were far too excited. Everyone must have been eagerly waiting for the signal to go. Tired as they were, there was this was no night for sleep. Suddenly, a dreadful sound rose on the midnight air. From all of the land of Egypt came the screams of frightened women mingled with wailing of thousands of people mourning their dead. The Egyptians mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, means like um, grieving, okay? When, you, when somebody passes away, we grieve over them because we have this deep, deep sadness. Sometimes it'll make us cry and some people wail or yell or kind of, ah, you know, that type of thing. That's what that means. Um, With wailing of thousands of people mourning their dead, the Egyptians who had killed so many of the Hebrews children were learning what it meant to lose their own. And it came to pass that at midnight, the Lord smote or destroyed all of the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of the Pharaoh that sat on his throne and to the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all of the firstborn of the cattle and the sheep and the goats that were left. This was the last... Oh, let me show you pictures. Sorry. Don't oh, lick your fingers, Terry. Okay, so here we see what might have been the angel of death getting ready to go over Egypt. Okay, or the death angel. And here at the bottom, we see, let's see if I can get this angle right. We see the people, the Israelites, packing and getting ready to go with the blood on their doorposts. And then they went in, and after they did their thing, got ready to go, they went in and just waited. Okay. Oh, and here is a picture that I have. Of what it may also look like. And now he sees the blood on the door, so he knows that that's, he passes over that. Okay? Right. This was the last and most terrible of all the plagues, and it brought Pharaoh. Finally, to his knees. The Bible says that he rose up in the night, and he and all of his servants, and all of the Egyptians, and there was a great cry out in Egypt, for there was not a house, there was not one, not one, shoot, for cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night, and he said, Rise up and get forth from among my people, both you and the children of Israel. And go and serve the Lord as you have said. Also take your flocks and your herds and be gone. So now Pharaoh is, is he's telling them, get out. Take everything you've got. Take everything that you own. Get out and I don't want to see you anymore. Okay? With death in every home in Egypt, the people had no desire to keep the Hebrews any longer. They wanted them to go now. They were urgent that they might send them out of the land in a hurry. 
They even heaped up more silver and gold and clothing upon them and their anxiety for them to be gone. Anything the Hebrews asked for, they were given. So it was said that the spool, so it was said, so it was that they spoiled the Egyptians, which means they took, they took all their gold and silver and everything that they had and they wanted them out and gone. That was one of the great nights of history, a night when a nation was born, a night when a million slaves became free, a night to be remembered through all time to come. And it was on that night that God promised, that God's promise to Abraham came true. Long ago, he had told his faithful servant, and he was talking when God told Abraham, that after 400 years, his children will be delivered from Egyptian bondage. Now the time was up and they were free again. And now they could go back to their homeland from which they had learned, yearned for so long. Okay, there's the Pharaoh, his son, his we don't know how old Pharaoh's son was. It just said that his son had died. And so that is what the Passover is all about. And um, I think that that is so important to remember that um, we have this, I call it, and, uh, and I use this from other um, Bible teachers who talk about this, this scarlet thread that runs all the way through the Bible. Well, we're talking about Jesus. I mean, the Old Testament reflects the New Testament. Jesus fulfills everything of the Old Testament. And so um, that's why it's important that we learn from the Old Testament and, and, and see that God's always had a plan and it always kind of remains the same. It's just a different method in the New Testament. Okay. And I hope that this makes sense and uh, gives you some understanding about the Passover and, um, and, 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 and to be very respectful of the Jews who still celebrate this um, and, uh, and and have some understanding, even learn about it. Go online, look up Passover and traditions and, and what it means and what the Jews do. They actually do different things. They eat certain foods and, and fast a little bit, and uh, which means they don't eat food. Then they eat some food, but it's certain kinds of food. And so um, I do encourage you to do that. It's really, it's very interesting. It's, um, I love the culture behind it. And, um, and I just, I think learning new things and respecting other cultures and other people is very, very important, especially, you know, Jewish people too. Um, these are God's chosen people. And um, so we're not any different. We're all people, but um where they come from and the backgrounds and their traditions are important. I think that we should at least look into them so we can have respect for them as we would want respect for us. Okay. All right. Well, that's all for today. And um, as always, take care and be safe. Okay. Bye.